All right, so I want to show you how to get into your digital version of your textbook. And then, since this will be mostly watched by my remote students, um, I want to go through and show you what we're doing in class as far as our reading and annotating um, of the story Beowulf. Be uh, the first section in Beowulf is entitled Grendel, which is a monster. Um, I have included our lecture notes, the master uh, copy of our lecture notes, highlighted. Please make sure you know that information, because that is testable material, particularly the highlighted stuff. And I refer to it a good deal in our reading and annotations. So be sure that you have looked at these introductory notes here, um, and you have them somewhere close by or you have them on a tab where you can click back and forth. I like to put them on a different tab where they can click back you can click back and forth. Now, in order to get to your 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 textbook, you've already been enrolled in the textbook program. So what you see here is our assignment. Um, the only way the only thing that'll look different here is that this video will be in here as well but since I'm creating it the video link is not there yet so to get to our assignment our reading assignment all you have to do is sign in here and it's going to use your Google account as your textbook account to get you into your textbook account so you'll click it now the first time you click it it's going to ask you for permission to use or to link to your Google account or to access your Google account and so you'll pull that up and you'll uh, click on your account in the window and then it will open up I've already done that so for me um, you did not see that there's a couple of features here I want you to be aware of this is our reading selection um, and for remote students this is a good bit of instruction to help you with annotation and also as a check um, in class of what we're doing. But you can also get it to read to you. You need to read the words as it's going along. That's going to help you remember more. But you can actually start the audio and play the audio. Grendel. Then a powerful deep. Okay, I don't have my speakers hooked up right now. You can also look at your notes. This right here is not some a tab you have when you go there. That is my tab. That is not anything you will see. So, as we read through this, which I'm going to start doing, um, just like I did with my uh, on-site students, I'm going to read a section of the passage and discuss and annotate in the next 15 minutes or so of this video and then I'm gonna have you continue the reading and the annotating um, on your own so let's get started then a powerful demon a prowler through the dark nursed a hard grievance it harrowed him to hear the loud banquet Every day in the hall, the harp being struck, and the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girded with waters. In his splendor he set the sun and the moon to be the earth's lamplight, lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves, and quickened life in every other thing that moved. So that's the first stanza, the first paragraph. I want you to understand a few things here. First of all, Grendel, I want you to notate. You And in order to add notes or annotations, annotations just means noting, um, you highlight what you want to make a note about. You can then pick what color you want the highlight to be, and then you can add a note here. So, name of the first monster. In the story. 
You do not have to use complete sentences, um, but it needs to be enough that it will trigger your memory when you go back and look over this again or look over your annotations or read them uh, to study for a test. So um, you can view in panel. What that does is that opens up the side panel where your notes will appear and then you can save and close. So there it is on your side panel. Um, so there we are. You can edit the note, you can trash the note, you can do various things with the note. Um, now, oop, that is the forward and back for pages. Right now we're just reading this page. If you want this note feature to go away, if you're working on a small screen, if you open it up, just go back to this notes button and click it again and then it will close. Now, we got that um, harrowed him. This is a this is one that I want you to add a note um, to, and you might click back and forth between this video and adding the notes as I discuss them. In mo there are many translations of this because the original English is not readable by modern English readers. Um, it harrowed him. The other translations says um, it um, tortured and caused him pain. So I think that's important because harrowed just means frightened. Um, it frightened him. But it actually causes him um, physical pain. So you really want to know that. Then, the next thing, and again, I'm working on the assumption that you have went to your master notes, okay? Um, your master notes are important because I refer to them a lot, and you'll be tested over them. Oop, that's not what I want to do. Um, here we have, in this passage of the text... Um, we have stories, we have reference to the biblical tradition. So, I'm going to add a note. And, and I'm struggling with my words right now. Uh, <laughs> um, anytime that something outside of the story is referenced that the author or the creator of the story expects his audience to be familiar with already because it's important in the culture of the time or something like that. It's called an allusion. In this story we're going to see a, quite a few biblical allusions or Christian allusions. This is a biblical allusion to the, the creation story. Now understand, when I talk about Christian tradition or pagan tradition, I'm not talking about our, our anyone's current belief system. We're talking about how the various faith systems in any culture that we're studying impacted the literature and the thinking of the time period. So we're not making any commentary about current belief systems. All right, so let's read on. Those are the two things I want you to know there. So times were pleasant for the people there until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of the grim demon, haunting the marshes, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the Creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For the killing of Abel, the eternal Lord, had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder, because the Almighty made him anthema, and out of the curse of his exile there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms, and the giants too who strove with God time and again, until... God gave them their reward. 
Okay, so we've got a couple of things here. In our notes, you'll see that one of the themes going down to the bottom here is good versus evil. You also see Christian and pagan influences that we've already had here. Good versus evil, we're already seeing that. This monster, um, Grendel, is set up Add note is set up as um, the evil in the theme of good versus evil. Also, uh, remote students, and I didn't think to say this earlier in the video. You can get from me a hard copy of the text. It's actually a workbook, so you can write in it and make notes. I will occasionally inspect annotations. You never know when I'm going to do that. Uh, I will make sure you, that I've told you that you need to be doing annotations, but I can take those up. Your annotations, I can see if you're doing them in the digital text. Anytime I want to look at them, I can do that, and I can add comments to your annotations. Um, the book, if I ask for your annotations, it will be, I want you to take pictures or images of these pages, of your annotations on these pages, and then you will upload those images, and I'll tell you that, so you can um, get those images, because they will occasionally be a grade. Hopefully you are actually watching this entire video, so that you're getting the lessons that, ever, that the class already got um, in class. So, good, he's, the, he's the good versus evil. I want to close that there. Um, now, moving around, on, again, talking about the translations here. One of the things that I want you to be aware of is it says here he dwelt with Cain's clan. I want you to know that Grendel is a descendant of Cain. Who is Cain? Um, Cain is the first murderer in the biblical tradition. Now, if you're a church-going person, you may know that already. Cain killed his brother Abel, and he uh, they were sons of Adam and Eve, and he is the first murderer. And in fact, after he kills his brother, God confronts him, asking him where his brother is, and he says, am I my brother's keeper? And then Cain is punished, and the biblical tradition the biblical story, the, bib the story in the biblical tradition tells us that God set a curse on Cain so that no other man would touch him or harm him. This story has taken that biblical tradition and the, this pagan monster that's originally from the story before the story, the story existed before Christianity in Europe, and they've melded these two traditions together by saying this monster was a descendant of Cain, that Cain's descendants that curse was that they would be transformed into evil monsters and creatures. And so Grendel is a descendant of Cain, the first murderer in the biblical tradition. Therefore, Grendel is cursed by God. Now remember, we're talking about beliefs of the time period. So, there we are. We also have, in case you didn't notice it, in this same passage, and it kind of overlaps, um, all of this that is um, biblical illusion. Again, they're kind of expecting you to know this story of Cain and Abel, and not everybody knows that story. People of the time period hearing this story or reading it would know it. So there's kind of an assumption there. 
All right. Now, I've already discussed kind of the universal themes, Christianity and paganism as, as thematic elements, faith systems, religious beliefs, and good versus evil. We have Grendel on the, bad, on the side of bad and God on the side of good. So, you could even make notes there about that. There are times when I might tell you that I actually want to look at these notes and grade them. So if I tell you to do that, then be sure to do that. Let's read on. So after nightfall, Grendel set out for the lofty house to see how the Ring Danes were settled into it after their drink. And there he came upon them, a company of the best, asleep from their feasting, insensible to pain and human sorrow. Suddenly then the god-cursed brute was wreaking havoc, gritty, Greedy and grim, he grabbed thirty men from their resting places and rushed to his lair, flushed up and inflamed from the raid, blundering back with the butchered corpses. So in this stanza, Grendel, who has been, they've caused him pain. And the reason the music caused him pain is because, which we see up in the beginning, is because of what they're singing about. They're partying, they're celebrating the opening of the new Mead Hall and a victory of battle, and they're partying, they're being loud. But some of their songs are singing about the creation story, the Christian creation story. And since Grendel was cursed by God, it causes him pain and discomfort. But he doesn't go and, you know, complain to his loud neighbors while they're being loud. He waits until they're asleep, and then he attacks them. And this kind of fits in with Cain in a sense that the sort of legendary ideas around the story that's in the Bible about Cain and Abel is that Cain waited until Abel's back was turned and then struck him in the head with a stone. It doesn't say that actually in the story, but it, it does, um, that's kind of the legend or the idea that's floated around it. And in this sense, Grendel's kind of a coward. He doesn't confront them and, you know, attack them um, when they're actually causing him discomfort. He waits till they're asleep. So, um, in that sense, his behavior is cowardly. Now, Ring Danes, that is the Danish people. Uh, this is set in Denmark right here. The Lofty House, I want you to, to know that... In our notes, we talk about um, the Mead Hall. Um, the Mead Hall is the center of society. Mead is a type of beer made from honey. And it does not say that, actually. So I'm going to add that to our notes. Mead is a beer made from honey. It was not just a recreational drink. Um, mead had a great deal of calories. And nutrients. Which could help Northern Europeans survive the winters. The tribes survive the harsh winters in Northern Europe. So it was a matter of survival. It wasn't just a, it wasn't like modern alcohol that is purely recreational in our society. So this lofty house is the Mead Hall. He's attacking the Mead Hall. And, um, he, but he waits until they're asleep. He waits until they're asleep. And then he sneaks up on them. Then he attacks them. He grabs 30 men from their resting places, kills them, and then carries their corpses back to his lair. What does this tell us about Grendel? 
Um, he's he's got to be strong. He's got to be strong, and you could just put strong and you know huge, huge to carry thirty warrior bodies, bodies of warrior men back to his lair. He's got to be pretty big. There's also a question here, and I'm going to put it, I think, right here. Um, sometimes annotations is asking yourself questions. If, if a question comes up that doesn't seem to be answered in your mind, um, you, might at, you might type a question and see if the answer comes up. For example, what is he going to do? with the bodies why would he carry them back to his lair infer that and my thought might be eat them but I can't be sure so I leave it at that in that moment all right let's read on then, as dawn brightened and the day broke, Grendel's powers of destruction were plain. Their wassail was over. They wept to heaven and mourned under mourning. Their mighty prince, the storied leader, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated by the loss of his guard, bewildered and stunned, staring aghast at the demon's trail. In deep distress, he was numb with grief, but got no respite. For one night later, merciless Grendel struck again with more gruesome murders. Malignant by nature, he never showed remorse. It was easy then to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance, to the bed in the bodies. For who could be blind to the evidence of his eyes, the obviousness of that hall watcher's hate? Whoever escaped kept a weather eye open and moved away. So in this stanza, we've got some important things. The next morning, they can see all the damage he's done. Um, the king, the, their mighty prince, you'll later find out that his name is uh, Rothgar, but you can go ahead and add that. Um, the Danish, the Danes, Danes, I can't type. Danes king, Rothgar. Um, he, he is just horrified. There are occasional vocabulary words that you can click on and it will give you a um, answer to that. So when you see that you can you can pick out that word but there's a lot of words that they have here that don't have that. Alright, the demon's trail. Well apparently Grendel's leaving um, I would say a trail of blood and gore that they can see that these men were killed and carried off. Also the term respite. We've done some context clues exercises and we're gonna have some more of those. Um, but respite, if you read the context, they get attacked uh, the king is numb with grief, but he gets no respite. For one night later, Merciless Grendel attacks again, strikes again. Respite has to mean rest or a break. Use those context clues. But you'll notice that I read an entire passage before I go back and make my notes. I read an entire paragraph, an entire stanza. I do that because I don't want to lose track of the story, the action of the story, and forget what's happening while I'm making notes. And again, hopefully you're clicking back and forth, stopping this video, and writing these notes that I give you. Because later on you're going to have to do it on your own, and I want you to be practiced with that. All right, uh, malignant. If you've taken Spanish, you should under, you should recognize that prefix word. Mal always means bad, like malnourished. So mal means bad. Okay, so malignant is bad, but 
understand mal always means bad. So anytime you see mal, malcontent. If you're not, if you're, if you have malcontent, that means you're not contented. You're not happy or at peace. If if you're uh, malnourished, you're poorly or badly nourished. Malignant. He never showed remorse. Then you see here that the warriors, because they can't seem to um, beat him or defeat him, and he always comes when they're asleep because he's kind of a coward, um, you'll see that they start, um, the warriors, the warriors begin sleeping far away from the mead hall. The meat hall is where the warriors would normally sleep. Now they're they're staying away from it. Again, again, lost my mouse. Um, we have a word here. This word I had never seen before the other day, and so I had to look it up. Other translations I've read doesn't don't use that word, but I I found an interesting thing. These um, in Scotland and um, the hills of mu much of Northern Europe um, uh, small rooms or chambers of stone were built into the walls of hills. Travelers um, could bed down in them for protection from the cold night and animals and things like that. Um, again, you don't have to write complete sentences. You can, you can condense these down as you transfer and write them on your notes. I might check to make sure that you are, you have done this, taken these notes, because I'll know you watch the video as well. And there are some things that, that in remote instruction you just can't get if I don't do a video and you watch the video in place of the in-class discussion and lecture. And in class we're discussing these things as we read them, but um, it's hard for you and I to discuss remotely and asynchronously. So, also we have one of our first kennings. Look back at your notes at what a kenning is. Um, a kenning it is on your notes. You really need to know this. Um, a kenning is a compound word, compound, usually a compound adjective, a compound word, adjective, that replaces the name of something in storytelling and gives the audience um, characteristics of that thing. Now you'll see here that even in these notes, if you mistype, you can see the squiggly lines. Don't ignore squiggly lines, people. Don't just accept them that they're always right, but look at them and make sure you've typed correctly. I can now save that. There are lots of kennings. Not every hyphenated word is a kenning, but there are lots of kennings and you need to know what those are. You need to recognize them when they're referring to something else. Let's move on. This is where I stopped with the um, with the in-class students and had them do their own annotations and then I reviewed with them their annotations and they added uh, what I thought was important. 
But since you're not here for that discussion, I'm going to just go through the whole passage. And then when we do Beowulf, I'm going to do the first part of the passage. I'll do a video with the first part of the passage. But then the second part of the passage, um, I'm going to want you to read and annotate on your own. Remember, you can always play the audio, but you'll have to do your annotations on your own. And I'll be checking those. So the story goes on now. So Grendel ruled in defiance of right, one against all, until the greatest house in the world stood empty, a deserted wallstead. For twelve winters, seasons of woe, the lord of the shieldings suffered under his load of sorrow, and so before long the news was known over the whole world. Sad lays were sung about the beset king, the vicious raids and ravages of Grendel, his long and unrelenting feud. Nothing but war. How he would never parley, or make peace with any Dane, nor stop his death dealing, nor pay the death price. No counselor could ever expect fair reparation from those rabid hands. All were endangered. Young and old were hunted down by that dark death shadow who lurked and swooped in the long nights on the misty moors. Nobody knows where these reavers from hell roam on their errands. It's very grandiose language. That's epic language. Now let's start back up here. So Grendel continues. He doesn't just attack that night. He starts continuing so much that they start deserting the Mead Hall. This attack goes on for 12 years. Now, in these times, in these cultures before they had writing, um, they would often mark the measure of time rather than with a calendar with, by marking the seasons. How many seasons have passed? How many winters or how many summers? Um, how many days or how many nights? How many full moons? They, they, they talked in that language. They were much closer to nature, so they noticed these things more than we tend to in modern society. So Grendel keeps attacking to the point that the news travels the whole world. Others start hearing about the attacks. And that's going to be important because our hero, Beowulf, that's how he's going to know what's going on. There were no news channels or anything like that in 500-ish AD when this story is set, which you see on the notes that we, we have. The text we have is from 1000, and the story is set at 500 AD. So, it's all unrelenting. Now, in our notes, this is, would qualify as a blood feud. It's a one-sided blood feud because the Danes can't seem to win. But we talked about blood feud in our notes, and um, I want you to know that term, blood feud. If you've ever heard of the Hatfields and McCoys, the History Channel had a great... Um, documentary series on the Hatfields and McCoys in America. They had a blood feud. Also another note, another thing from our notes going with blood feud is Weregild. And Weregild, were, like werewolf, were means a person, a man. And guild, in this context, it's related to the word gold. Um, but it means payment, so the price of a human life. If you killed somebody by accident or intentionally, their family, their tribe, could expect you either to pay for that loss, because that's a loss to their tribe and maybe a threat to their survival if they kill the best hunter or something, but also um, if you did not pay, they could kill you or one of yours in, in Weregild in repayment for that death. And this is where blood feuds get really, really going. Weregild is not, I don't know how much it really was effective. It was an attempt to make sure to provide the option of paying rather than more life being lost and more important, valuable warriors who could protect their tribes from being lost. Whether it was effective or not, I wonder. Um, you know, blood feuds are a pretty serious thing, and people won't always view money or gold or wealth as a replacement for their loved one. So, but here we have Weregild. <clears throat> 
Here we have Death Shadow, that dark Death Shadow who lurked and swooped in the long nights. Death Shadow is a kenning, referring to the monster. Grendel. Now, some might argue this is actually an epithet more than a kenning. Um, epithets replace people's names with descriptive phrase that that describes them. So that great warrior, instead of using the term Beowulf, um, would be an epithet. But I'm not worried so much about that. Um, in this case, we're calling that a kenning, and we're not really use, dealing with the term epithet too much. All right. We also see that he is roaming at night. Okay. We also talked about you know, Kennings. Let's read on. So Grendel waged his lonely war, inflicting constant cruelties on the people. Atrocious hurt. He took over Herot, haunted the glittering hall after dark, but the throne itself, the treasure seat, he was kept from approaching. He was the Lord's outcast. Okay, this is a short stanza. There's some important things here that I want you to, to make note of. And again, hopefully you're watching this whole video. Herot, they kind of throw this in um, to the passage. And where we started is 65, 70 lines into the poem. We miss all the introduction to the poem. It's very long and has a lot of details about things we don't need. Herot is the name of the Mead Hall. Again, if you just want to type Mead Hall, you can do that. You don't have to do complete sentences. Of course, that's not a complete sentence itself, but you can use fewer words. You don't have to type full statements. He took over Herot. I know that this is Herot, though, if I had not figured that out, or I didn't tell you that, um, because it talks about the hall right after that that he's haunting. So this is a restatement of this part of the sentence. But the throne itself, the treasure seat, he was kept from approaching. He was the Lord's outcast. This is uh, part of that theme that I, I have in our notes. Um, the theme of good versus evil. Right. Also, I shouldn't versus students are so used to seeing it abbreviated that sometimes they don't know how to spell it. Um, the theme of ver good versus evil. Grendel represents evil. The powers of evil. The throne, meaning the king, not the chair itself. Um, the, the Danish king... Sorry about the printer. The Danish king um, represents good. Again, see my double line? I mistyped. I mean my red line. This also reflects the Christian tradition of kings ruling by divine right. Now, if you're taking government, you may have had information recently about divine right. Divine right is the concept that was forwarded by the church and by the um, royalty that they are kings, they are leaders of nations because God has chosen them to be that and therefore you cannot question their authority. In this sense, Grendel cannot touch or harm Hrothgar, the king of the Danes, because he is chosen by God to be king. But he can kill everybody around him. Alright, so let's read through this. Um, 
I'm going to read through the rest of it, and then I'm going to go back and make notes. That way this video stays a little shorter. Um, we did this over two days in class. So I'm doing this in one video for remote students, but it took us two days to work our way through this passage in 45-minute segments. These were hard times, heartbreaking for the prince of the Shieldings, the Danes. Powerful counselors, the highest in the land, would lend advice, plotting how best the bold defenders might resist and beat off sudden attacks. Sometimes, at pagan shrines, they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way and their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts, they remembered hell, the almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens and the high king of the world, was unknown to them. O oh, cursed is he who in time of trouble has to thrust his soul into the fire's embrace, forfeiting help. He has nowhere to turn. But blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in their father's embrace. So that trouble time continued, that woe that never stopped, steady affliction for half Dane's son, too hard an ordeal. There was panic after dark. People endured raids in the night, riven by terror. All right, so let's go back real quick here. And the Shieldings are the Danes. They're called the Shield Danes or the Shielding Danes. Um, and the attacks go on and on. And they begin to sacrifice or pray to their pagan gods. This is from the pagan tradition. Now, when I use the word pagan, I am referring to any of the non-Abrahamic um, faiths, generically. It is not one belief system or one religious system. In that, it, It's kind of a catch-all term, um, and it's not meant to be derogatory or insulting. It, it's just the way to, to refer to... Um, mostly the polytheistic religions rather than the Abrahamic religions, the three sister religions of Judaism, modern Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, which all arose from Abraham and um, actually reference each other's texts within their own texts, um, or their texts intersect and tell some of the, many of the same stories. So, um, it shows that they're doing this and this is where we run into a problem because then down here we start explaining why they sacrifice to the stone gods and not to not um, praying to the God of the Christian tradition and that's that causes a problem and the reason it causes a problem is that um, they say something here. I was going to try to pull that open, but it's not letting me do that. Um, they say here that um, that th the Lord God, the God of the Christian tradition, was unknown to them. They didn't know anything about um, Christianity. They hadn't heard about the Christian God. This creates textual... Um, textual conflict. Um, the text contradicts itself. The whole attack, the attack started, the attacks started because of the party and the songs of the Christian um, creation tradition. So now it's saying they didn't know anything about it. Well, you can't know about it and then later not know about it. Um, in the way that it's being described. Now, 
the final thing, this last part um, also fits something from our notes. Um, homily, a written sermon or section of poem that gives direct advice um, about how people should think, believe, wow, my typing is really bad right now, and behave. Any place where you feel like it's giving you advice or a lesson about how you should live or that you feel preached to, that is a homily. And so here is all of this is homily. This is example of homily. You definitely want to know that because we get homilies throughout. They're not always um, Christian homilies about faith. Sometimes they're about what a good warrior or a good man should be like and how they should behave. But anytime you're being told how you should live, behave, or think, you're being given a homily, which is a short lesson or sermon. <clears throat> now, the story continues on. Half Dane's son is one of these epithets, which I'm not making you know the term eth epithet, but I want you to realize that instead of saying the king of the Danes, the Danish king, shouldn't capitalize king there, um, Rothgar, we'll see his name later, um, so make sure you know that that's referring back to him, again those context clues we've been working on. Now, so that got us through the first two days of our reading. Um, I will post a video uh, for tomorrow that will take us through Beowulf. That one I'm going to only do the first, I'm going to do about two-thirds of that passage, but then the last third, I'm going to want you to annotate it yourself. Hopefully you have went through and, and, and filled in all these annotations. It doesn't have to be the same color, it could be all the same color, whatever you want to do, but go ahead and make sure you're doing your annotations because that's something later on I'm going to be looking at to make sure you've completed and those should be easy completion grades. If you have any problems or concerns, please make sure that you email me, get me a message so that I can get back to you. I do teach first through seventh period straight through with about 20 minutes for lunch. So it's after 3.10 that I have my conference, and then I have bus duty, and then after that I sit back down. So it'll be, within 24 hours I'll respond to you. But it, it might take me a little bit if you email me in the morning. All right. I miss you guys. Hope before the year, the school year's out, that we get to all be together and, and, uh, and we get to know each other. <laughs>